Um, well, I want to thank everyone for uh, attending today, both online and in person. Uh, we have a quick, relatively two quick presentations about uh, two projects that are ongoing um, in, for famous projects in Arizona. Um, first will be George Bisbal talking about shortage declarations, some of the planning response and consequences, and then I'll give a quick update on an assessment project we have going on in partnership with uh, Southwest Decision Resources, uh, looking at drought and climate vulnerability in a few uh, rural communities in southern Arizona. So, um, I think with the two of us, we're both planning on quick-ish presentations. Uh, so there's plenty of time for questions or discussion afterwards. And that seems to be one of the more productive uses of these type of events. So uh, with that, I will hand it off to George. Okay. okay, so uh, drought in Arizona, so we were talking about drought when it's raining, but um, Arizona agriculture is pretty much drought proof, or at least crop agriculture. I'm not talking about like ranching that's basically rain fed uh, agriculture. But irrigated agriculture, <laughs> farmers know it's hardly going to rain, uh, and they're used to it. As long as they have assured water supplies, it's not a problem. In fact, I've been doing extension for more than 20 years. I've never heard a farmer once in any extension meeting ever complain about not enough rain. The only time they, they, I've heard people complain about, oh, it's raining now, I can't get into the fields. But, you know, you know we're pretty much drought, very drought resilient up to a point. Okay, what happens though, is that if you have prolonged drought, you can create a tipping point where those assured water supplies can go away. So the issue I'm looking at is, we all know the Cal Colorado River is over allocated, and we've had recent declines in Lake Mead getting close to an official shortage declaration, which will take a lot of water, um, surface water, uh, away from central Arizona agriculture. Here's recent trends in, in Lake Mead elevations. And that angry red line is a line kind of at the end of August when we, this, we had this, this would trigger a shortage and narrowly escaped that in 2016. Uh, 2017 looked better, 2018 not so good. And if there is a shortage declaration based on uh, elevations in Lake Mead, Arizona has to give up increasing amounts of surface water. Okay, so here's projections of shortage conditions that the uh, uh, Department of Interior has come up with. And you can see that Different levels of shortage are kind of no risk right now, but better, better than a coin flip odds in each of these out years that we're going to have a short, at least a tier one shortage declaration with some non trivial probabilities of having more severe cutbacks. And this graph, I think, kind of tells the story better. This is uh, Interior Department. Um, projections going out in the out years, and this is kind of the upper and lower bounds of shortage projections, and you see that it's, the forecast is starting to look like, well, we're gonna be in shortage perennially for many years in a row. So that what would be considered this thing we really want to avoid um, is gonna be a regular business as usual. So, um, is there a way to yeah, cut the, let's see, That's, yeah, this one, go down there. Yeah, until it's not. No. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, I've been focusing on what, what would happen in Pinal County agriculture if uh, there was a shortage declaration. So here's the CAP agricultural settlement pool. And the big uh, CAP water users are um, four irrigation districts. Um, in the Pinal County AMA and, and also Pinal County, the Pinal AMA and Pinal County. There. Okay. Here. Okay. Okay. So in 2004, there was an Arizona Water and Settlement Act, and the irrigation districts gave up long-term uh, subcontract rights to, to cap water. In exchange, they got off the hook of paying back the debt, the interest payments on the construction of the cap. 
they also gave, there was restrictions waived on acres that could receive cap water. And there was a re ultimately a reduced price that farmers had to pay for cap water deliveries. So basically, they only had to pay the energy costs of delivering water, but not all the, the interest costs in having the cap built. In exchange for that, they uh, uh, gave up rights to cap water uh, uh, in, in the out years. So here's the ag pool allocation. And it starts out 400,000. Just recently, it's dropped. It'll, yeah, follow the bouncing ball. So just recently, this got ratcheted down to 300,000. Then it got ratcheted down, to, it's going to get ratcheted down to 225,000. After 23, it goes away. So Pinal County irrigators know, or at least thought, by 2030, the cap water is going to go away. Got it now, but eventually it's going to go. Okay. So their plan was, currently the ag districts are about on two thirds cap, one third groundwater. So by 2030, the idea was that they were gonna to transition to 100% groundwater, maybe perhaps getting some other surface water from other sources. But the idea was that by 2030, we're gonna be pumping groundwater and we're just not gonna have cap water. And the two largest ag pool districts, uh, Maricopa Stansfield and Central Arizona Irrigation Drainage District, are about 50-50 cap, uh, 50, 50, 50 cap, 50 groundwater. A lot of the folks on cap water are cotton farmers who are, are producing on rented land. And that will be important later when we discuss possible <coughs> impacts. So the research project I'm looking at would be, okay, what's, what would be the, the first part, what would be the economic effects in central Arizona ag if you actually had a shortage declaration? And how would those effects spill over to the wider regional economy, uh, primarily in Pinal County? And then now there's negotiations underway uh, for a drought contingency plan where the, the ba lower basin states would cut back their use sooner rather than later to uh, make this situation less dire. So the idea is, can we kind of start to cut back now instead of waiting for a crisis uh, and then having to cut back for many years in a row? So what, when they did the 2007 uh, interim guidelines, Bureau of Rec, the input-output analysis to look at the economic impacts of fallowing. So they assumed that uh, water would be taken away from central Arizona, Arizona irrigation districts would just fallow those acres. And the idea is that they would fallow the least profitable crops first. Um, and they stopped their kind of analysis there. And so what they basically did is they ranked crops by profits per acre foot. And say, here's their baseline water supplies. So if there were a shortage, then they would just fallow these crops, fallow the lowest, uh, least profitable crops first. And then they accounted for multiplier effects. Uh, there's induced effects, which are the, you know, when farmers make money, farm workers get paid, they spend their money in the local economy. These are, these, this generates demand for all sorts of things, consumer products, they're paying rent, they're buying cars. So, so if you reduce agricultural demand, you're gonna reduce demand for consumer goods for, and services. Also, there's indirect effects, because when farmers produce things, they have to buy farm inputs. And so if they're producing less, then they're going to be buying fewer farm inputs, they're going to be hiring less farm labor. And so those sectors of the economy would shrink as well. So here's what they estimated for um, uh, a 400,000 acre foot shortage in non-Indian agricultural lands in 2017. So they were making this forecast back in 20. Uh, 2007. So the direct impacts overall would be about 14 million. These indirect 
induced solar fire effects for about half again as much, almost 800 million. The total cost of loss in, in personal income would be about 21 million. You don't really, you can't really see that there. Yeah. Okay. All the bounds involved. Yeah. Almost about 22 million. Um, so that's what they projected back then. Yeah. Okay, so here's the cutbacks to Arizona under the 2007 interim guidelines. And you can see that the big cut comes to the ag pool, basically Indian priority. This is MI, it's municipal industrial, so we turn on the tap. This doesn't really affect So agriculture is going to make pretty much all the adjustment. There's a shortage. And that's, that's common throughout most Western states. They have long, their long range contingency plans are that ag is gonna cut back and they're gonna do all the adjustments and the people in cities don't. Uh, and, and, and that's how it is in California, that's how it is in New Mexico as well. So under the lower basin drought contingency plan, uh, the cutbacks would start in sooner and at higher levels. So it would levels of 10,090, which were already below, you start to have tier one cutbacks. Uh, the old tier one, instead of cutting back 320, you cut back over 500,000 acre feet. So these cutbacks are a lot more severe. So ag would, would hit cut, get cutbacks that would be bigger and, and likely sooner. So what, what do we think ag, ag responses in Pinal County? Well, nothing's really certain because you know, these, this, this deal is still being negotiated. Uh, I'm told the governor wants to sign a deal. Various legislators want a deal to come through. But the question is, um, uh, the irrigation districts are, are told, we're gonna have a new deal where you're gonna get hit hard. And you're probably gonna lose a lot of water pretty much with certainty in 2020, uh, as opposed to rolling the dice. Um, and so talking to some different irrigation districts and kind of where people were saying, well, we probably have to, to make up the water shortage, half of that shortage would be dealt with by fallowing crops. But the other half would be, well, we're just gonna irrigate the crops with groundwater. Uh, and these districts had already planned to switch from surface water to groundwater, but they were planning on doing it between now and 2030. Now the talk is doing it between now and 2020. So the adjustment is going to be more stark and more fast, more fast, faster. Uh, and so to, to the extent that growers can switch to groundwater, I mean, okay, you can switch to groundwater, that's better than fallowing, or at least you're getting something. Uh, irrigating with, with groundwater co cost estimates is about 20% more. Uh, but in the long term, that means there's going to be more pressure on groundwater resources. And also, the, if everybody starts to pump, the water table starts to drop, those pumping costs are going to go up too. Okay, so to get a sense of, you know, this is just if I drag this, you can drag it wherever. Right. 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 That's good. That's good. Don't mess with it. Don't, yeah, yeah, there we go. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So um, here's here here are wages. It's actually easier in some ways to get wage data burrowed down uh, than actual farm production and profit data. But wage data gives you kind of an indication of of the size of the sector. We can figure profits or something over and above the wages. But this is this is you know. Uh, employee income and among crops the single largest is cotton with, um, with over nine million dollars and I, I kind of highlighted vegetables and greenhouse and nursery products in black because chances are when there's a water shortage those that production isn't going to go away that's relatively high value production it's relatively profitable so where the cuts are going to come it's going to be in cotton farming hay farming uh, this is all other grain this is going to be things like barley and sorghum, uh, wheat farming. So the, the crops in white are the ones that are, are probably going to have the cutbacks. Okay. 
Okay. So what I have up here are, are what are called location quotients. The location quotients are used in regional economics to measure uh, what sectors of the economy are part of an economy's base. The idea is that um, there are certain sectors of the economy where they're producing more than is needed to sustain the local economy. They're, they're actually producing something that's like a, a, an item that's exported. And so it's bringing money into the local economy from outside. And so if you think of things like dry cleaning, a county isn't going to specialize in dry cleaning. And so if you look at the, a, a county share of dry cleaning jobs to the national share of dry, dry cleaning jobs, it's about one. Or local car washes, right? You know, an area isn't going to necessarily specialize in car washes. So uh, the location quotients are about one. So it's the share of a particular sector's jobs in the local economy divided by the share or the national share. And to give you, and so you can see so if it's one, it's, kind of, it's, it's this is a non-basic sector. And the idea is that basic sectors are generating income from outside, and they're, they're what makes the economy run. And you have non-basic sectors that support the demands of people in the basic sectors. To give a real simple historical example, in California in 1850, gold mining was a basic sector. Saloons are a non-basic sector because, it's, although it's, you don't know, maybe saloons were basic because maybe there were more saloons than the national average in San Francisco at the same time. But things like gold mining would, would be very, very high. Doing like gold assaying, banking probably was actually higher uh, in, 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 because that was something that they specialized in. So the location quotient tells you what parts which, which sectors are bringing in money to the local economy from outside. Because everybody, the, 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 or the saying is that you, know, you have to have basic industries because we can't all be doing everybody else's washing, right? Because if, if, I'm, you know, if I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing your washing, you know, everybody's doing uh, everybody's services. And in fact, I recall somebody in Maricopa County at the height of the housing boom he was in this house temporarily in this cul-de-sac, and he goes, we're all building houses. So he goes, I don't understand. Something's got to give because we, we're all building each other's houses. This has got to end sometime. And sure enough, it did. <laughs> so to give you a, so the higher the location quotient is above one, the more specialized you know, the economy is. And, and so you can see right at the top, like copper mining, it's like 148. And then all the, the dark highlighted things are ag-related, food processing related industries. And to give you a sense of scale, the location quotient for auto, auto, automobile manufacturing in Detroit is about 13 or 14. The location quotient for electronics manufacturing in Santa Clara County, which is Silicon Valley, is about 16. So, you know, you know, copper is very important, but so if you have like dairy cattle and milk production, so that means employment in dairy cattle and milk production in Pinal County is 25 times the national average. Um, dairy product manufacturing is about 10 and a half times the national average. So these sectors are all way up high. I mean, there's other things that go all the way down to like, things down to like 1.25 are considered basic sectors but to make the font big enough for anybody with regular vision to see, I had to cut it off. And one of the things you see is that Pinal County's economy, <clears throat> the base of their economy, is still really, really highly dependent on agriculture. And if, and if you take all the wages from basic sectors um, in Pinal County, ag's about uh, one fifth of all the wages. So there's still, you, know, you think, okay, there's Phoenix, there's Tucson, you know, is, is ag really that important in, in Arizona? And in Pinal County, it still is. And then you get another taste. Let's see. So one of the other things is what Bureau of Rec looked at was, okay, 
if you have reductions in crop production, it's only going to affect the crop sector, and then they stop. So one of the things I'm looking at is, well, a lot of crop production is for the dairy industry. The dairy industry is really big in Pinal County. So do you start to have spillover effects to the feed and forward purchasers? So if alfalfa starts to go out of production, because alfalfa is relatively water intensive per acre, um, are dairy producers just easily going to get hay and alfalfa elsewhere? Or is that going to actually cause their supplies to constrict? Other things that we might look at is cotton gins. Again, cotton is, you know, it's big, let's go back. I think cotton ginning. So cotton ginning jobs, you know, the share of cotton ginning jobs in Pinal County is 23 times the national average. If you have cotton acres shrink below a certain critical mass, they can't support a gin. So, you know, would cotton production shrink enough so that cotton gins in, in the county are no longer viable? Are some of the things I'm looking at. So here is, here's total wages um, in manufacturing in Pinal County. Um, a lot of times people focus on, man, you know, presidents and other people really focus on manufacturing jobs um, because these things were, you know, that we did historically, these jobs tend to be relatively high paying. And so this is uh, all wages in manufacturing uh, in Pinal County, and then they're ranked by North American industry classification. And dairy product manufacturing is the single largest manufacturing sector in uh, Pinal County. And like all other food manufacturing, is another 10%. So if manufacturing jobs in Pinal County, one third of them are, are food and ag related. So you have this kind of integrated system of you know, dairy production. And again, part of the location quotients for dairy production are pretty high because a lot of this stuff is going to, you know, it's going to Tucson, it's going to uh, Maricopa County. So dairy production is, you know, in, in county terms, is an export. Uh, but in another way, you know, dairy production is an important local food. Uh, in, in central Arizona. And we have this whole complex of locally produced feed and forage going to the locally produced milk. <coughs> now, another thing that Bureau of Rec did when they did their analysis, they just picked numbers from our cooperative extension crop budgets for a single year and did the run. You know, and that's, that's a perfectly fine thing to do, but farm income's really, really volatile. As you can see, here's, here's different measures of net income per irrigated acres in the three central Arizona counties. So if you really, you know, if you're going to say, what's the impact on agriculture of a land fallowing, it depends a lot what year you pick. And one of the things we want to do is to actually look at possible ranges. Um, and you get this paradox. If it's a good year, if it's a high income year, then fallowing land takes a greater absolute amount of your income away. But if it's a bad year, it takes away a higher percentage of your income away. So you know, your net income could be really, really low in a bad year. So suddenly if, oh, I can't produce or I've got to switch to more expensive groundwater, that, that could push some farmers you know, to the edge in bad years. Okay, so uh, again, talking with growers and irrigation districts, the whether land is going to be fallowed or whether it's going to go to groundwater depends on a lot of things. Is the land owned or rented? Well, if you're renting land, you know, putting new, you know, if you're renting land and you're getting cap water, it's like, well, you don't really have necessarily the scope to put in the irrigation pumps and infrastructure to start using groundwater. If you own your own land, like a lot of the uh, dairies in Pinal County actually own farmland and they're operating uh, farms because they were concerned when we had the housing boom that all the, the local alfalfa production was going to go away. So they kind of vertically integrated. They bought up farms that are operating farms. So a lot of alfalfa production is actually on owned land 
using groundwater pumps. A lot of cotton production is on rented land, relying on surface water. Uh, again, and then talking to folks, you know, I was asking them about, well, how Bureau of Rec did that, the things by, you know, uh, ranking crops, and then, like, the lowest value crop would completely disappear first before you had cutbacks. And the thing they said is, is more on a land quality basis, because different types of crops are grown on different quality of land, and that um, you probably see more diversity in the kinds of crops that would go out of production. Another concern is what are energy costs going to be? Yes. Have, have people looked at subsidence in terms of increased groundwater pumping for land quality issues? Uh, recently? Um, I mean, it, historically it had been a big problem yeah, in recently. Central Arizona. But since um, we've been putting Colorado River water into the aquifers, water tables have been going up. I guess I'm mean, are people that... looking at what's going to happen when everybody turns the pumps back on? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an issue is, is, you know, the idea is that these, you know, all these irrigation districts are going to switch to, switch the pumps on. What is that going to do to the water table? Um, okay. So, again, you know, I think what Bureau of Rec did was actually pretty reasonable. Um, I've seen other studies done by unnamed universities north of here that, or frankly kind of silly, which I'm going to go into. Uh, but uh, I, thought, I think what Bureau of Rec was, that, was actually a real good job. I think they could have looked at more possible scenarios. I think if you were going to pick a limited number of scenarios to really focus on first, I think they did the right thing. But I think there's things to be added by looking at more scenarios. So like, you know, what, what's going to happen? when there's the switch to groundwater. What scope is there from switching crops, different kinds of technology? Um, farmers very much like some kind of mitigation. That's one of the hangups right now in the drought contingency plan, is that farmers in Pinal County really don't want to sign on to this. So there's a lot of political impetus to get this deal done, because Arizona is very nervous if we have more, more and more cuts. Once, once a shortage is triggered, one of the other things that, that happens is the Secretary of the Interior then gets involved in terms of, okay, how are we going to divvy up things um, henceforth now that we're in the shortage predicament? And I think there's, there seems to be at the state level about the only thing that different states agree on is we don't want Washington in here making <laughs> You know, deciding stuff. We'd like to kind of settle things out and head that off. And so, but at that said, there's been a lot of efforts that Bureau of Records did paying people to forego use of water to keep water in Lake Mead. Um, it, it doesn't seem like there's going to be like legislated funds available for Pinal County. The other thing now, Pinal County irrigation districts are looking at is are there other water sources? that we can get to mitigate the losses of the cap water. Uh, there's other surface water sources. Apparently, a bone of contention is a lot of groundwater that Phoenix has banked, but they're not using. And Pinal County irrigators are saying, well, you bank that. You don't have, that's not really spoken for. You just have it there. If you want us to agree to this cut, these cuts, can you, we, we would like that water. But that, right now, is a bone of contention. I'm done, right? Um, we get that time for questions. Yeah. Could you speak for a minute about that last slide, that last next to last item? Funds highly limited. Yeah. What is what's going on right now? I know let's talk about some, what's coming with this new deal, but what's going on right now? What's already in place in terms of payments to Pinal County farmers or others? Bureau of Rec has done various like it had small pilot programs, basically. You know, pay people to not take their deliveries. Like they have an agreement with Dr. Cohen, I don't know if they have one. They have different agreements with like, like the Yuma Mesa Irrigation District to not um, uh, basically take their water out of like, Lake Mead. But that, that's a very you know, small scale, I mean, they call it pilot program. And that's, that's funded by uh, Department of Interior, that's Bureau of Rec money. So then the, uh, 
you know, the other issue is would there be state money, state appropriations used for that? And talking to the districts is they think that there's, there's not going to be any state funding for, the, for that kind of thing. So that's going to be measured on a dollars per acre basis to keep things simple, or is it going to get nuanced into different um, considerations? In uh, the, the way uh, Bureau of Rec has done it is, I think they do it on a per acre basis, but accounting for certain, taking certain acres out of production, you know, uh, uh, that maps into different amounts of water. So I think the payments are like per acre, but they're thinking in terms of, of acre feet that you're keeping in Lake Mead. I mean, okay. yeah, I mean, so again, the federal programs account for that, but there seems to be, what I've heard from uh, folks in Canal County, there seems to be no deep and abiding desire to use, you know, Arizona appropriations for this. And so where the negotiations are going now is, can we get some water somewhere else? to compensate. So what I see is that some people are paying money to put water in the water, uh, groundwater, and then other people get to pump it out just for the energy cost. Yeah. That seems like a pretty direct subsidy toward the groundwater pumpers. And in general, you seem to be saying that water is allocated based on rights without there being a real market mechanism to just auction off the available surface water and, and balance supply and demand that way. Is there any movement toward more of a market, the true market mechanism, or is it we're all just playing games shuffling around water rights? Uh, we're all playing games shuffling around water rights. I mean, economists, you know, and Oh, you're economists and thinking you just, oh, it's always better when lawyers are involved, right? So, but um, no, I mean, that, that's a bone of contention where, you know, the Pinal folks are saying, we're going to take a hit, you know, and we want some kind of mitigation or compensation. The counter argument is, well, wait, you're getting, you've been getting subsidized, right? And, and that, that debt forgiveness and that low cost, that's paid for by Pima County and Maricopa County property taxes. So you know one of the, you know one of the arguments is like, look, you sign this deal to give up this water. You're, you're basically you're going to give up the water anyway by 2030. But now the deal is a little different because they're talking about we want you to start giving it up in 2020. So it's a matter of adjustment. Uh, yeah, but uh, there's very very little talk, you know, outside of you know among economists about using market mechanisms that I've come across in this state. You would think that in a Republican dominated state, some sort of market based solutions would be more popular. I don't know, it, it's, that's not, has not historically been the way that's done. I mean, there is, there, there's water trades that go on bilaterally, uh, you know, and there have been deals between irrigation districts and, uh, you know, municipalities, more in California than here. But I mean, there's water trading going on, you know, to, to a certain extent all throughout the West. When you talked about the integration of the uh, agriculture and the economy, and you used the example of cotton and, um, and the alfalfa. So when the BOR says switching to less water intensive crop, let's say they switch alfalfa, which is highly um, water yeah. It's a high amount of water and it switched to, I don't know, wheat. wheat. Yeah. Well, have they thought about how it's going to impact uh, the, the chain down the line, the, 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 dairy, the dairy farmers who cannot no longer grow alfalfa and then have to buy it at the state. And same thing with, with cotton. Is there sort of a, as an economist, do you see any sort of switch towards changing the agricultural? model you know, yeah I mean the what what Bureau of Rec did I mean they have they, they use this kind of candy put output system which is readily used you know you can get the software you can get the data uh, but what that model assumes is that all prices are fixed and that how uh, different industries are linked it's it's all demand driven 
So if I demand more milk, that means there's going to be more demand for alfalfa, and it goes up. If there's less demand for milk, there's less demand for alfalfa. But it also assumes, unless you trick it in some way, if we just cut back in this model, what, would, what happens or what the Bureau of Rec did, they go, okay, alfalfa production goes down. What does that do to that, the price of alfalfa? They assume no, no change in price whatsoever. Or the price of cotton, or cotton. You know, and that may not be a bad assumption because growers can go and buy alfalfa you know, from someplace else. And then actually I've got a, a grad student looking at that. What happens when local alfalfa production goes down, does that actually bump up the price that dairies pay? Or can dairies pretty much get it kind of at the going US price from other places? Um, and it looks like, you know, there's a, there, there's, there is a bump up in price, but not, not a huge one. Again, the dairies in Pinal County are kind of in trouble anyway. They've got a lot of, their, their stock of cows is pretty high. And so they're probably going through decline for other, or, or hard times for other reasons. You know, but again, um, yeah, I mean, you can model, that's one of the things we're trying to do in this project is, you know, how, how is post farm gate, you know, food and agriculture and fiber production affected when you have, you know, you know reductions in, 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 in the, uh, the farm industry. But what, what Bureau of Rec did, they kind of they took this model off the shelf and they ran it for all its work. And so now we're getting under the hood and going, well, we, could, we can make it more realistic here. Look like you're puzzling. Are you get the question ready, or yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it seems to be that uh, when you're looking at groundwater as a source for uh, crop up agriculture, that seems like a disaster scenario to me. Because groundwater is a, as it has historically been unreliable, and when you collapse an aquifer, isn't it worthless after that? I can't speak to the hydrology of what you know. I mean, you can't. Uh, yeah, some will have yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I simple mindedly I can go, yeah, beyond a certain point, and yeah, you, you create you know lots of problems. Um, whether that will get uh, to that point or not. I mean, if you look at plans for central Arizona, the plan all along was that you know agriculture was going to slowly transition down as houses started to go up. So um, I think what's going to, but it's. Uh, and that's another thing. How can we expect a continued uh, population growth when water resources are going? Well, again, it's a matter of, you know, this gentleman's thing about, you know, markets and prices. If suddenly starts, we have water, and it's going to be more expensive to get that water, you know, farmers are going to start to get a signal that, oh, water's getting scarce as, as the aquifer starts to drain down, as pumping costs go up. You know, another thing you could do with building, right, you could have, you know, you could have impact fees so that any new development going in has to actually pay for the, right, if a new development comes in, they're going to draw the aquifer down, they're going to make everybody's water costs go up. So if an impact fee actually charged development that amount when they came in, uh, that would mean you had less growth, or at least growth would account for that kind of effect. But where is the water coming from? Yeah, right. yeah. I mean, it would go to tier one, tier two, tier three. I mean, and climate projections aren't getting any rosier. Uh, it's going to get hotter. And drier, yeah. Um, no, I mean it's it's a different you know setup than we've had because kind of Arizona's dirty little secret was that we've had more surface water than we literally knew what to do with, right? And so you know, we'll, we'll, we'll just put an aquifer for now. Uh, Related to your um, economic modeling here, costs going up if there's the scarcity factor involved. Um, CAP takes less water for whatever set of reasons. Leave it in a lake, um, whatever. 
Um, we're hearing that the prices are going to go up even if we're not in the, the ag approval because mm -hmm. the fixed costs of the utilities that deliver us water here in tier two mm -hmm. uh, remain the same. Is that kind of calculation being um, factored into these models or is that going to be done in a different place like within our own water utilities? I think the utilities, I mean, I, what I'm focusing on is more what's going on the ag side in terms of what pricing is going to happen to like urban users. I haven't really, you know, gone into that. Okay. I don't know if you remember a few years ago when, you know, everybody in Tucson was asked to cut back on their water use. And they said, oh, that's great. Everybody's cut back on their water use, but we still have our fixed costs, so we're going to raise your rates because we were charging people per, you know, gallon of water they used. Everybody used less gallon. They still have the same cost, so they, 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 up, they up the rates. I mean, coming from a different, uh, coming from Europe, looking at the price of water, it's ridiculous, especially in a place like the West. The cost of water is so low, considering the scarcity of it compared to, uh, and it looks like people are really allergic to the idea of, of paying more for water, particularly in a place like here, where sources of water are not that many and, and looking into the future. So do you think the price of water also is an issue here that people don't want to pay for water, even though it's a scarce resource? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I was at a, another was a meeting about water rates, you know, in Tucson, and people were coming in like they were like screaming about their water bills. It's and they're nothing. talking about, oh, the water price has gone up this percent. It's like over 20 years. That's kind of not a lot. But again, you had all these people who were on fixed incomes. You know, and the big issue is if this, I'm living on Social Security. And this is a big, this, you know, and for me, I'm spoiled, right? You know, I make good money. I'm a university professor. So, you know, it doesn't hit me. But I, I was amazed how many senior citizens would come in. And, you know, but you could tier prices, right? You get a very, very low base price for essential needs and how things ratchet up. Um, but, I mean, water, water does get reallocated. And when it gets scarce, people are very ingenious. You know, if you look at, you know, water efficiency in places like Israel, where water is really, really scarce and very, very efficient. Um, you know, and that, that will happen, you know, over time here too. But, but uh, our, our kind of growth model, our population and economic growth model thinking has to to change. It's different when you've got, you know, Colorado River water always coming in in a renewable way. That's very different when, oh, now, now it's, now I have this wealth that, that I'm depleting. Your mindset has to change. It's like, well, it's like when you retire, right? When you're working, I have my income coming in, so I can spend and spend and spend it. Once you retire, that income isn't coming in, so you've got to kind of steward what you have. So you're thinking, you know, basically it's like, you know, in terms of water, we're retiring. So we now, we now have to live on our retirement savings because we don't have, we don't have new water coming in. So you know, we have to plan accordingly. Okay, so I think, oh, did you have one more? I was just gonna say briefly that the other thing about digging deeper and deeper for groundwater is that what, from what I've learned, the quality can get pretty bad, um, which would be detrimental to certain crops if you're getting into really 